Hi, I'm Barbara Lucas, and welcome to The Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. Pesticides can impact human and environmental health. Wouldn't a chemical-free control of our insect pests be great? Better yet, what if it didn't cost us anything? Well, our guest today tells us we already have this, but we're on the verge of losing it. It being bats, and bats are in trouble. Our guest is Rob Myas, Executive Director of the Organization for Bat Conservation. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Well, we're really pleased you could squeeze this into your busy schedule. I know you're touring all over the country talking about bats. Um, you came here all the way today from the um, Cranbrook Institute of Science, where you have your offices for your uh, organization, which is um, really doing well. And you're an author that has recently published this book, Bats A to Z. Yep. So you're a really busy guy, and we're really lucky you could be here today. And you brought a friend, which is so exciting because he's incredibly beautiful. Uh, what kind of bat is that? Uh, you know, it's funny to to explain to people that this is called the big brown bat. <laughs> and we so call it tiny. the big brown bat because most bats in Michigan and most bats in the United States are actually smaller than hmm. this bat. The big brown bat has a wingspan of about 14 inches, but the little brown bat has a wingspan of about 10 inches. Huh. So as we head north in Michigan, we start to see more of the little brown bats and less of the big brown bats. So this is extremely common urban bat that we have flying all around hmm. here. And that was the bat that was in the house where you let me come along when you did a bat exclusion? That's right. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of bat that also has adapted to living near people. So it might live in people's attics or behind their shutters or in their garage or in their barn. The good thing is, is that they do adapt to people. Um, I'd say the negative side would be is that they sometimes get in our house. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of things that people can do to help, you know, bats stay out of the house. And we're going to talk about those. The first thing, though, is I'm kind of confused because it's so tiny. And you said bats are really important for insect control. Can they really make a difference on our insect populations? So bats are the only mammals in the world that can fly. No other mammal in the world can fly. And since they're mammals that fly, they have to consume large numbers of insects or large amounts of pollen and nectar or fruit or fish, whatever it is that they eat. All of our bats in Michigan eat insects. And I brought him a little something to eat. We'll see if he's hungry. Uh, the, uh, this kind of bat right here would eat two to 5,000 insects every single night flying around. So right now he's eating a little mealworm. <laughs> Wow. And bats flying around use ultrasonic sounds. So as they fly around at night, they give off these sounds, ah, 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 bounces off of things. And they know where things are, even in pitch darkness. Now, bats aren't blind, but they use this ultrasonic sound to be able to navigate pitch darkness. So what I have here is a bat detector, and it picks up the ultrasonic sounds. So if I move the bat around, Oh my goodness. It's echolocating right now. Did you see his mouth, yeah. his mouth opening? Now if yeah. I don't move him, he stops echolocating. Now his name's Radar, by the way, and he has an injury. He can't be let go into the wild, so we have him as a rescued animal that lives at the bat zone at Cranbrook Institute of Science. But in the wild, they would use their echolocation to fly around. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. Amazing. So it, just like whales or dolphins use their sounds to be able to get around, our little bats have to do that because of how dark it is, and they're catching things that are in flight. So something like a fruit bat really doesn't need echolocation because it's not catching its fruit. It's stuck on a tree. Mm -hmm. And so the energy required for flight is just so great. Okay. That's right. That makes sense. Well, it's a good thing that they um, eat so many insects because it sounds like, uh, you were telling me that the um, value to agriculture is immense, right? Yes, yeah, so there was a, a great study that came out that estimated that U.S. farmers benefit at least $3 billion annually, but it's wow. probably closer to $20 billion. And, and we're starting to identify the exact species of insects that the bats are eating. So this DNA testing, this genetic testing has really allowed us uh, to, to find out information we could never have done before. We, we'd collect the bat's guano and we would dissect it and we'd say, all right, well, it was eating beetles, but we don't know which exact beetles. Now we know spotted cucumber beetles or mm. emerald ash borer beetles oh. or uh, 
cotton bollworm moths hmm. or um, corn earworm moths. These are very detrimental insects. They cause a lot of damage to crops and they cause a lot of cost mm -hmm. to farmers to get rid of. So hopefully our farmers can use a less insecticides to control with the help of the bats. That's, that's right. And what we're seeing is when when bat houses, let's say, are implemented and brought into an area and, and the population stabilized of bats or even increased, uh, they're spraying less pesticides, hmm. uh, especially towards the beginning and the end uh, because of the bats being there controlling some of those insects. And farmers, I've heard um, if they keep their woodlots intact around their farms, that that helps the bats too, because apparently some bats uh, live in trees, right? That's right. So most bats are crevice dwelling bats and they're gonna like to live inside of something. So like we talked about with people maybe having a bat in their attic, that's a normal place that they would try to find because they're hiding away from predators. So a bat going underneath the loose and peeling bark of a dead tree or in a hole in a tree, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Some bats live in live trees, those are solitary bats, but most bats are colonial and they like to live inside of something. Mm -hmm. So uh, wooded edges around the, wo uh, around the farm uh, lots itself are really important. You know, it also decreases runoff, it, erosion, uh, uh, wind, you know, blowing away the topsoil. These are all really solid ways of, of helping to preserve and sustain farming. Win-win. And then um, insect-borne diseases like West Nile virus, um, perhaps the bats can help us fight those? Yeah, so bats are consuming a lot of other insects. So they're eating not only moths and beetles, but gnats, flies, and mosquitoes as well. Bats aren't predators only of mosquitoes. Nothing is because mosquitoes during dry season will dry up and you don't see any. Yeah. So most animals or most animals that eat mosquitoes just eat some mosquitoes, but bats eat so many insects that even if they eat some, like 10%, they're eating a, a, a decent amount of mosquitoes. So right, we're looking at these insects that also are spreading diseases that bats are helping to keep their numbers lower. Well, unfortunately, bats are in trouble. So we've got, um, tell us th the main reasons. It's so such a sad story. Well, there's quite a few reasons. I mean, habitat loss is definitely a big one. We have more than seven billion people in the world. So more people, more highways, more buildings, less places for everything else to live. So that's one issue. Pesticides and pollution. I mean, when we talk about it's bad for us, we are large mammals compared to small mammals like bats. Bees and butterflies and, and birds are, are slowly disappearing as well. You know, I'm sure you know, everybody has heard that the bees are disappearing. But even this past summer, uh, we, we were hearing accounts of butterflies not being here. I, I'm really concerned about what, what these ramifications are and what the causes, and I think some of these are link, linked together, habitat loss, pesticides, and also even just people not planting for these wonderful animals. Hmm. People uh, are, are maybe getting away from gardens that just benefit wildlife, and they're easy things to do. But the biggest problems for bats are a fungus that's affecting bats that accidentally got here from Europe uh, a little under 10 years ago. We call the disease a white nose syndrome because we first saw it on their nose, even though it's all over their skin. And it happens to them when they're hibernating the it other gets one, in the caves because it's cool um, temperature loving fungus, I guess. Yeah, isn't that strange? Yeah. The, the, guan, uh, the, the guano inside the cave provides uh, a lot of nutrients in the cave and it provides this really, uh, really interesting cave environment. So all these animals have kind of come in here because of one of the reasons is bats. But this fungus also lives in this cold climate, mm. cold, dark, humid climate. Mm -hmm. And the fungus grows in the soil, it grows in the guano, up the caves, and then it starts to grow on the bats. Mm -hmm. And so this fungus grows on the bats during the winter and the bats wake up too many times and they end up starving before the winter is over. And I heard there's nothing that can be done about it really because the, um, the ecosystem within the caves is so delicate that any, any kind of like treatment would just mm -hmm mess up everything. So exactly, we're really concerned about treating a natural ecosystem like a cave, but what we can do is we can treat artificial hibernacula. So that's when we build a concrete bunker or something that maybe already exists that's concrete like a mine. 
mm -hmm. or a, a dam or something like that where the bats are going to that we can do some type of treatment, non-toxic, but also it doesn't kill off the good fungus that should be there. Mm -hmm. We're starting to look at those treatments this winter and some applications are gonna go on and we have high hopes, but unfortunately this fungus has spread 25 states, five provinces in Canada in only eight years, it hmm. spread that quickly. And millions and millions of bats are dying. Absolutely, every year at least a million bats are, oh, are dying from it. It's awful. And then uh, to be just on top of all that is the wind turbine problem. Yes. So can we address that? Yeah, so it, it, it's great that we're looking at greener ways of producing energy, but unfortunately, during the fall, especially when birds and bats are migrating, this isn't just Michigan, the United States, North America, this is all over the world. Mm -hmm. There are issues in Italy and in Brazil, everywhere, mm -hmm. because unfortunately these turbines are so large, so immense, birds and bats are migrating and they see it in the distance and they think, oh, there's a nice tree maybe to go land on, or they're just curious animals like we are, and they come up close to it and they get sucked into it and hit or uh, the barometric pressure actually causes uh, the bats to explode. Oh. And so it's either hitting or the bar a change in, drastic change in barometric pressure. But unfortunately, uh, we, we estimate about a half a million bats in the United States are being killed by wind turbines. Hmm. So there are some, again, there's a little bit of a, a, a scientific fix we might be able to help with. Good. Changing the technology Mm -hmm. um, some, some ideas are actually even a change in the way that the blades don't rotate this way, the, the blades rotate this way. So it can be a total oh. change in the way that they're made, uh -huh. completely wildlife friendly, and mm. it rotates the air within it, mm. re-rotates it, reuses it to, mm. to create more energy. But even with the ones that are current, giant, you know, blades, those blades can be halted and held off from turning until the wind gets five meters per second or more. And so when the wind rates are higher, there's less bats that are flying because hmm. it's probably too windy to fly. Is that called the cut-in speed? That's right. So hmm. if we look at five meters per second or greater cut-in speed, that means when the blades start turning, it reduces mortality by 85%. Wow. That's huge. Yeah. But there's also ways of tracking bats with radar. There's even ways of predicting when the bats will be flying. And if we could just have the blades turned off during that time, that reduces it as well. When is their migration season? Well, we're learning a lot about that. So one of the things that makes it difficult to answer these questions is that we don't know a lot about bats. Hmm. I find it fascinating. Policymakers probably find it quite frustrating. Uh, and when we're trying to answer questions like this, we're piecing the information together. We do know that bats generally migrate in the fall, mm -hmm. late summer, early fall, but different species migrate at different times. Mm. And then migration might be short distances within the state just to go to hibernate, and other ones are across the country or, or south, mm. down as far as Texas or maybe even farther. Because I'd heard that if they would just turn off the wind turbines at night during migration season, but I guess it's not so easy to figure out when they're going to be migrating. Well, we're making progress there, and as we put time, effort, and money into that, we're finding there might only be a two-week period that, mm. that the majority of bats are migrating. So great, let's just reduce it during yeah. those two-week period. It's very little energy that's lost, mm -hmm. and then very little income uh, you know, or profit for the energy companies as well. Well, seems like it would be worth it. I think so. Yeah. Um, so there, I've also read there's things like ultraviolet light or ultrasound that can be added to the turbines. Yeah, so we've made good progress there too. So they're looking at all kinds of great ways to detract the bats and either from, from um, light or especially sound. This has made some good progress as well. A sound that's basically kind of put out that the bats can hear, and as they're coming in, their echolocation gets a little screwed up, or it also just kind of, you know, really bugged by it, and they come around it, and they move around it. Now, it, will it be financially viable to do that on all the turbines? There's a lot of turbines now. Uh, or will it just be easier to, you know, to shut them off at certain times? I think we're gonna use a combination of these, predicting when the bats are, are migrating, 
uh, using sound to be able to push the bats away from these areas. Maybe there's light, and then also the cut-in rate would mm. be higher. Well, I hope they do it fast because with the white nose syndrome really knocking them out, boy, we really need every bat we can get. I think that really complicates the issue. And unfortunately, we've got bats now that are being considered for the endangered species listing. Mm. And because of white nose syndrome, well, that's going to really complicate things with the wind turbine placement as well. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense for all of us to work on this together yeah. to s slow or stop the white nose syndrome, uh, the, the fungus from spreading, find ways to reduce the mortality at, at wind turbines because otherwise it really complicates being yeah. able to put these 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 big projects into, into uh, sure does. yeah. So homeowners, uh, we have bats. A lot of us have bats in our attic. I, yeah. I've had them and <laughs> a lot of people. So what can we do? Um, our uh, family went through the bat exclusion in our house in Northville back when we lived there. And um, I watched you as you did one in a house in Chelsea. So let's just talk about the basic steps of a bat exclusion. The first step, I think, is putting up a bat house. Okay. So if you have bats in your attic, one of the best things to do is give them an alternative right away. Because if they don't have anywhere else to go, that's why they've moved into your house. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's because dead and dying trees might not exist. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where they live. Remember, we said that before. Otherwise, they'll end up in people's houses. They're animals, just like us, that get used to something. They're creatures of habit. They go into the same place year after year after year. So what a bat house does is it gives them a safe, warm, dry place to raise their babies. Small spaces, you know, the attic vents, in houses is perfect for oh. this. Or the trim around the top of the house. Yeah. That's the space right here. Mm -hmm. And so what this does is it gives bats a safe place to raise their babies. I would put that up right away. As soon as you know that there's a bat there's bats living in your attic, put up buy or build a bat house, put it up so that the bats have somewhere else to go. Then you want to watch the house at night. The bats come out about 15 minutes after sunset. So if sunset's at 9 p.m. By 9.15, the bats will be coming out. You just take a lawn chair out and watch the bats. They're not going to attack you. They won't eat. You know, they might fly down near us because they're eating insects, but they won't hurt us in any way. Watch where they're coming out. And then you could go up during the day and put on some type of one-way funnel or flap to be able to keep bats from getting in. So this is what, this is what we talked to the family in Chelsea about, an old farmhouse. Mm -hmm. I've worked in brand new houses that had bats in there, in, in there hmm. too, because this, the, there was a lot of little s strips that were missing or a little mm -hmm. loose, and the bats found it. Hmm. And well, so what this does is it gives uh, the bats somewhere to exit from. They leave through here, but then they can't get back in. So you would put this up on the side where there's a hole. Mm -hmm. Once you watch the house, you identified where it was, you go up there during the day, you put this over the spot, tape it or staple it, the bats come out, they drop out and they leave, the bat house is there for them, and then they can't get back in because you've sealed it up. So it could be as simple as that. But in the meantime, you have to um, also plug all the other holes in the house, right? Because <laughs> right. that, that was a big deal in the house in Chelsea because it was an older house with was, lots of... Yeah, it was an older house. So I, I've, I've worked on big old houses like that before. It could definitely take several days just to go around and find. You might have three main places where the bats are coming and going. Okay. So you leave those three places. You caulk all the rest. You fix the flashing. You, you, know, you fix the pieces that are falling apart. Once everything's fixed, then you put on three exits that the bats then can exit from, and mm -hmm. then they can't get back in. Because, right, if you put that up, it'll and nothing else is sealed up, it'll just keep moving and moving and moving around the house, the bats will. And that's not, that's not going to be good for anybody. Mm -hmm. We want to e eventually uh, humanely evict them so they don't live in the house. They live in the bat house so that they can continue to help eat insects and live in our neighborhood. And at the um, bat festival, the Great Lakes Bat Festival that you had, I guess it was the seventh annual, and I went to it last fall. Um, Somebody asked uh, where you put up the bat house, and they said, how can you get them up on a tree when the, there's so much poison ivy, et cetera? And I, um, I remembered what I heard you say, that they're not, it's not so great to put them up in trees because they're too shady, right? You right. Want, it, want it on a south-facing or some warm part of the house? Yeah. So you know, Or a pole? 
a pole on the side of a building work best. A big, tall, mature tree with a lot of trunk space, but I'm talking like 30 or 40 feet of trunk space because we want a bat house up about 15 feet off the ground. Okay. And it's simulating the loose and peeling bark of a dead tree. Uh -huh. So a dead tree, there's no shade hitting it. It's yeah. a nice, warm, dry yeah. place to raise their babies. Okay. That's why people end up getting bats in their attic. Mm. So it's not a great, I wouldn't recommend putting it on a live tree. Well, we only have a couple minutes. Let's talk about what you can do if you find a bat inside your living space. If you find a bat in your house, the first thing is obviously don't grab it, don't touch it. It'll bite to protect itself. Rabies is very rare here in the United States because we get our dogs and cats vaccinated. So mm -hmm. keep getting your pets vaccinated. <laughs> That's awesome. But if a bat's in your house, don't grab it with your bare hands. It'll bite to protect itself. If there's any chance that anybody came in contact with the bat, local animal control should come out, capture the bat, and have it tested just in case. Okay. A lot of people know, though. I opened up a garage door, and I was bringing groceries in, and the bat flew in. And I know that it didn't come in contact with anybody. The best thing to do is probably just to open up the front door and let it fly out on its own. The bat's using their echolocation. They have eyesight so they can see. They don't want to be in the house. It was a mistake, and they want to fly out. Otherwise, it flies and lands and then just stays there, maybe even falls asleep. You can put on a thick pair of gloves, uh, use a towel or a bucket, put it over the bat, scoop it behind, take it outside by a tree or a bush, and just let it go. Okay. So they're, they're very non-aggressive, but they'll defend themselves. So always wear something to protect yourself. OK, good advice. Um, so with the bat exclusion, I think I forgot to ask you, what, is, what time of year can you do that and when shouldn't you do it? That's a really important part. So it's important that you don't do it during the winter because okay. the bats aren't coming and going. And they could be, there could be a few bats that are hibernating in the wall or underneath the insulation in the attic. So don't just seal up holes because they'll end up in the spring, they'll wake up and they'll go inside your house mm. instead of outside. So don't, don't do anything during the winter. But wait till the spring or late summer or early fall. So in Michigan, generally, we don't do an exclusion in June, July, especially those two months. But about, um, you know, anytime in April through mid May is a great time. And anytime uh, August, September, and even into October, if it's still warm, is a great time then as well. Because we don't want to attract, we don't want to trap babies inside as well. Uh -huh. So during the, during the winter, you could trap the adults inside by just sealing it off. And then during the summer, you don't want to trap babies inside because they can't fly and they're not coming and going. That'd be awful. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we have a lot of different things we can do to help bats. So that makes me feel a little better about this whole terrible white nose fungus. Right. Um, how can people get more information? Well, people can go on our website, batconservation.org. They can also go on our savebats.org. So we have a, we have a great new uh, initiative that we launched nationwide to help engage with people. And some of the things that we want people to understand is they can do things in their backyard. They can put up bat houses. They can plant wildflower gardens to uh, give bats a good place to eat food. Reducing pesticides is very important so that we give birds and bats and bees mm -hmm. the ability to do what they do best and for free. Mm -hmm. These are all benefits that we get from them. Um, and even, you know, simple things like what we buy, our organic food what, that we buy does make a difference. But in our own backyards, we can make a difference for wildlife and especially educating people. We have this ambassador program that we engage with people and give them the resources to do like we're doing right here. But you could do it with your friends and your family and the clubs and groups that you belong to. That's great. Great. Thank you so much for all this great information. And on the website, they'll find a short movie that you just created with the makers of the Batman movie. And we're going to show just a really short clip of that. And then people can continue watching it on the website. And also, these are recycled from our set. So Superman and Batman fought within the walls of these bat houses. So maybe buy one, donate to the bats. It's important because all these bats are dying right now. Bats all over the world are perishing from a lot of different reasons. But in North America, this white nose syndrome, this fungus that accidentally got here from Europe, is just causing massive die-offs of bats. If bats can raise babies that are healthy and they go into hibernation, they're going to be more likely to make it through the next winter. This is the kind of bat right here that we're going to save. This is called a big brown bat. This bat right here, hundreds of bats would be able to live in one bat house. 
This bat and other species have been dying to the extent that they're on the verge of extinction. But luckily you can do something to help. SaveBats.org is a place to go to learn more about this and hopefully to contribute some effort toward preserving this important, valiant night of a species for now and years to come. Thank you. I love that movie. People have to go to your website to see the rest. Thank you so much for being here today, Rob. It's been really great. Thanks a lot. And I, really, I look forward to people engaging back with our organization as well. Great. For an online archive of today's show, go to ewashtonaorg forward slash green room. Thanks for joining us here in the green room.